Heavenly Father, we pray that you would enable us to be biblical in our convictions. Anchor us in the glorious truths of your word that you have clearly and forthrightly presented repeatedly and consistently. And from those biblical convictions, we pray you will help us to live our lives and to be a true reflection of your truth in Christ. And we pray, amen. <clears throat> Well, tonight I want to go to the Old Testament. I actually have two uh, passages close together from 1 Samuel. Now, in case you don't know, that's the book ahead of 2 Samuel. Just to try to help out any way I can. And um, this is a passage, this chapter 24 and chapter 26. I'm going to chop off a slice of chapter 24. Four and a slice of chapter 26, but those two passages relate to each other in that they, they give two examples that say the same thing about David in his life, um, which reflects the fact that David believed certain things to be true. He was anchored in his convictions about what God had said and he was under that authority, and he made choices that were commensurate with those convictions in very difficult circumstances. So tonight, the title is Convictions Inspiring Choices. Convictions Inspiring Choices. Uh, it'll be helpful to know some of the background. I'm not going to read the entire story um, but in both cases, the background of these two passages is this. David has already been chosen by God to be King Saul's successor to the kingship. That happened in chapter 16, where Samuel anointed David as the next king because Saul had disobeyed God. And uh, Saul knew that David was the next guy, and that was a threat to Saul. Thus, Saul determined to kill David, thinking, hey, I've, if I kill him, he can't be king, and maybe I'll be okay. I'll continue to be king. And so David is running from Saul, fleeing for his life in both of these cases, both these chapters. And, um, and you'll see in just a bit where David had, had experienced where he could have killed Saul. He had an opportunity to kill the man who was trying to kill him, and he refused to do it. And you'll see that. Chapter 24, 1 Samuel, verses 4 through 7. This happens in a cave where um, Saul has gone into the cave. The text says to relieve himself, and I think that means take a nap. Uh, because of what happened here. And verse 4, And the men of David said to him, Here is the day of which the Lord said to you, Behold, I will give your enemy into, his hand, into your hand, and you shall do to him as it shall seem good to you. Now David was in the cave. When Saul went in the cave, Saul didn't know David was in the cave, took a nap. David's in the cave, and they said to him, Hey, man, we got him. Verse 5, or end of verse four. Then David arose and stealthily cut off a corner of Saul's robe. That's interesting, isn't it? Um, he uh, didn't hurt him, but he cut off a corner there. I, I would presume to show evidence to the fact I could have killed you. Here's the corner of the robe, but I didn't. Verse five, afterward, David's heart struck him. Interesting because he had cut off a corner of Saul's robe. Verse 6, he said to his men, the Lord forbid that I should do this thing to my Lord, the Lord's anointed, to put out my hand against him, seeing he is the Lord's anointed. Verse 7, so David persuaded his men with these words and did not permit them to attack Saul. 
And Saul rose up and left the cave and went on his way. So David's conscience is so sensitive that the very fact that he's cut off the corner of Saul's garment makes him feel guilty. I shouldn't have done that. I mean, that's not a big thing, right? I mean, you can get into the rope, but <clears throat> it was just the fact that he had even taken that action. I think that's, that signifies the quickness and the sensitivity of David's conscience. Chapter 26. Different uh, time goes on. <clears throat> uh, David continues to run from Saul. Saul continues to pursue David. And this time, uh, Saul and his army uh, are encamped out in a, a place on a hillside. Uh, in verse 3, it says, encamped on the hill of uh, Hilkala, which is beside the road on the east of Jezumon. And I don't really know where that is, but that's where they were camped out. And David remained in the wilderness, uh, and he saw Saul come after him into the wilderness. So, um, Verse 6, they snuck, David and some of his men snuck into Saul's camp at night where Saul was uh, asleep, again, asleep with Saul's army encamped around him. Verse 6, David said, Ahimelech, the Hittite, and to Joab's brother, Abishai, the son of Zeruiah, who will go down with me into the camp to Saul? And Abishai said, I'll go with you. Verse 7, so David and Abishai went to the army by night, and there Saul was sleeping within the encampment with his spear stuck in the ground at his head. And Abner and the army lay around him. Verse 8, then Abishai said to David, God has given you your enemy into your hand this day. Please let me pin him to the earth with one stroke of the spear. I will not strike him twice. And I believe he meant it. I believe he was that good. A good, I meant skillful with <laughs> spear. Nine, verse nine. And David said to Abishai, do not destroy him. For who can put out his hand against the Lord's anointed and be guiltless? David said, as the Lord lives, the Lord will strike him. Or his day will come to die. Or he will go down into battle and perish. And that's exactly what happened later on. Verse 11, the Lord forbid that I should put out my hand against the Lord's anointed. But take now the spear that's at his head and the jug of water, a jar of water, and let us go. So they, they took items near King Saul to show that they had actually been there, but they did not harm him. Verse 12. So David took the spear and, uh, and the jar of water from Saul's head, and they went away. No man saw it or knew it nor did they any awake, for they were all asleep. And I like this part, because a deep sleep from the Lord had fallen upon them. So the Lord made sure they couldn't wake up. Well, both is, is obvious. Both of these situations tell one specific thing about David, that he had convictions about what was right, and those convictions drove him to make decisions about those convictions how to apply those. So tonight I want to give you those, those two, two things. Um, the first concerning David's convictions, uh, I want to talk about six convictions that he had. David's convictions. And then from that, I want to point out how David made choices that were relevant to those convictions for choices or four characteristics of the choices that David made in obedience to God in keeping with his convictions. Let's begin with David's convictions. His six convictions are these, and I think you'll see an obvious crossover to my life and yours. Number one, David believed. David was convinced that God was sovereign, and David felt that he was obligated to God's truth, and he was accountable to God for what he did. Is that true of us? Are we convinced of the sovereignty of God? David believed nothing happened, but that God was sovereign over it, 
And David was accountable to God because God was sovereign. David was accountable to God and to God's truth. And that is really at the heart of this. David believed that there was some thing, literally some body bigger than he was, that David was not the center of his universe, but God was. Number two, David also believed that his behavior should reflect his convictions. There should not be a dichotomy, a divorce, a separation between what you say you believe and how you live your life. That's called consistency, moral and theological consistency. And it's amazing. A lot of people don't believe that. Uh, They either don't believe that what they believe has anything to do with how they live, or they, they, they relate to those in such two different ways, they see no way that they relate to each other. David, however, would not agree with that. David believed in God. He believed God was sovereign. He believed that God himself had made him king elect (laughs) and that God was going to pull that off. And he had no business putting his hand in God's business. And he lived that out. And by the way, none of us ever do this perfectly, do we? I mean, I don't. don't, You may be perfect. I'm not perfect. But But that's how we want to live. Number three. David also believed, we're talking about his convictions here. David also believed that circumstances in life did not allow him to alter God's truth uh, and that uh, circumstances that happened in his life did not change David's obligation to obey God's truth. In other words, that may not be a good way to say it, but no matter what happened, the, the consummate obligation that David felt in his life was no matter what situation he was in, in that situation, he was obligated to do what was right. That no situation, no matter how difficult, no matter how advantageous in certain things, this or that, gave David the right to do anything other than obey God. Now, there used to be a book. Uh, many years ago, maybe some of you remember this book. I think it came out in the 60s, which now sounds like ancient history. But uh, the title of the book was Situational Ethics. Do any of you remember that book, Situational Ethics? And the thesis of this book is what's right and wrong? Well, it depends on what situation you're in. So situations determine what your ethical obligation is. David did not subscribe to situational ethics. The situation did not change his obligation to do what was right in God's sight. Number four, fourth conviction. David did not believe that God was inconsistent. So that divine providence would lead David to do what God had declared in his revealed word was wrong. Um, You know, I've heard people say this. And it's really sad. Um, some, I haven't heard anybody say it lately. I think people are learning not to talk to me about stuff like this. But something that they want to do that they know is wrong. And they'd say to me, well, the Lord has led me to do this. I say, time out. Let's get something straight. If God says something in his word, he will not countermand that in your life experience his providence will not lead you to do what he has said in his word don't do okay so don't blame god for your wanting to sin okay just own it i just i don't like what god said in the bible and i want to do what i want to do and i don't care what god thinks about it well thank you for being honest but that's a wretched attitude but that's another issue altogether David David did not look at the opportunity to kill Saul as something different from what he knew God did not want him to do. Number five, David, in his conviction, believed that God manifested 
his divine authority in human experience through common grace in human positions. Human positions of authority that God himself had authorized. Let me read that again, because that's a little bit convoluted. David believed that God manifested his divine authority in human experience through common grace in human positions of authority that God had authorized. Now, I think I need to unpack that a bit because, in fact, sadly, I raise issues sometimes that I'm not going to deal with, and that's a problem I have, and it, you have to live with it. But there are certain, and I, and I don't think David could have written a thesis on this. I'm not suggesting to you that David lived in a time in revelatory history where these things had fully developed and matured in theological thought. But I believe somehow, some way, David came to believe that all authority ultimately relates to God. God is the ultimate authority. And that in human experience, there are units of authority. That by common grace, God established family, government, so on and so forth. And that any authority that's experienced in our humanness was actually a reflection of God's authority. Does that make sense a little bit? So that, that's the basis where the scripture says, if a parent rebels against, I'm sorry, if a child re rebels against a parent, they're actually rebelling against God. If you rebel against government, you're actually rebelling against God. Now, Romans 13, write that down. Because Romans 13 tells us what government is meant to do. And I am not defending here tonight, nor will I defend the moral behavior of this government. We're not talking about this government or any particular government. We're talking about human government as human government is supposed to act in human affairs. God is not for anarchy. God is for order. And, and God established government I mean, King Saul was actually God's allowance. Now, granted, King Saul was not a great king. And God didn't want Israel to have a king in the first place. But he allowed them to have this king, and God chose Saul. David realized, David said Saul was king because God picked Saul to be king. And for all of his sin, that's still something he needs to respect. There's, a, there's, a, there's a, at least one chapter in a book in that point. And I think we need to think about that. I, I'm going to stretch it just, I don't have time tonight. This, this is supposed to be a short sermon. But I believe the rise in women preachers today is actually an extension of feminism, which is a rebellion against God's authority. Now, that'll give you enough to keep you awake tonight when you try to go to sleep. Number six, David believed that God did not need human help to accomplish his divine will and plan. Thus, David left his becoming king in the hands of God and waited. I should add, and kept running for his life. His job was to stay alive. David knew God wanted him to be king. But David did not translate that into go kill Saul so you can be king. He believed that whatever God willed, God would accomplish. That was his conviction. Those are six convictions that David had. Which leads, those convictions leads to David's choice. And uh, that choice might be described as not killing Saul. I'm going to define it as David obeying God. And there are four characteristics to David's obedience to the Lord in not killing Saul. Number one, David did the right thing despite the situational opportunity. We've kind of already dealt with that, so I'm going to not say much about that. Number two, David did the right thing despite his personal difficulties that he experienced with Saul. Would you say that David and Saul were friends? Yes. 
Would you say that Saul treated David unjustly? Would you say that David was mistreated by Saul? Well, why didn't David see the opportunity to kill Saul as a fulfillment of social justice? Because David, as we've talked about before, was committed to doing what was right in the sight of God, regardless of his relationship with Saul. Just because you have a bad relationship doesn't give you the right to mistreat anyone else. Number three, David did the right thing, despite the bad counsel he received from others. <laughs> in both of these cases, people said to him, go get him. <laughs> there he is, right? In the cave, man, the Lord. This is providence. You're in the cave. Saul comes in the cave to go take a nap. God's in it. Go kill him. And, and the sleep that that Saul and the army experienced in the field in chapter 26 was asleep from the Lord. Maybe David, go on, man, just let her rip. Take your revenge. But David, as far as I can tell, stood alone in his conviction among these men. Did you know there's going to come a time when you have to stand alone? in doing what's right, because everybody else around you thinks you're nuts. <laughs> you ought to do this, or you ought to do that, or why don't you think this way, or live that way? But you got you, you got to be willing to not follow the crowd. Number four, four characteristics of his obedience. Number four, David did the right thing and waited on God to work out David's problems and plan. He waited on the Lord. How many times in the Psalms, among the Davidic Psalms, did David write about waiting on the Lord? This man knew something about waiting on the Lord. We Americans, you know, and I'm, you know, I can't criticize anyone else. I'm the world's worst. You know, I heard a guy say one time, he said, man, he, he just, he likes to go, 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 go. Every time he's in the car wash, he looks for a passing lane. Microwaves cook too slowly, you know, and I get it. I'm, the, I'm there with you, you know, but sometimes the, the only thing you can do is wait on the Lord. It's not time. God has his way. God has his time. So I think I want to, say two things in closing trust and obey <laughs> i think that's what david did that's how he lived he he believed and he trusted the god in whom he believed the only thing that mattered to him was what god had said was what was right in god's sight and was he going to do it or not that's the only thing that mattered Um, we're living in a time where it's going to be very difficult for us to do that. And I, I hope to just sprinkle salt in every sermon that I preach in these upcoming weeks that we need to hear, we need to hear the call of God to be God's people reflecting God's word and God's truth in the way we live. And we cannot follow the teaching of a pagan, ungodly, hell-bound society. We've got to reflect the truth of God's holy law. I love that song, Trust and Obey. It kind of says exactly how I want to land tonight. When we walk with the Lord in the light of his word, what a glory he sheds on our way. While we do his good will, he abides with us still and with all who will trust and obey. Not a burden we bear, not a sorrow we share, and our toil he does richly repay. Not a grief or a loss or a frown or a cross, but is blessed if we trust and obey. We never can prove the delights of his love until all on the altar we lay. For the favor he shows and the joy he bestows are for them who will trust and obey. And the last verse is really sweet. Then in fellowship sweet, 
we will sit at his feet or we'll walk by his side in the way. What he says, we will do. Where he sends, we will go. Never fear, only trust and obey. The course, trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Heavenly Father, I pray you'll help us tonight to flesh this truth out in our own life experience, not defining what is right by circumstance, situation, popular opinion, the counsel of others, but rather to come to grips with the reality that what is true and what is right is what you have said in the Scripture. And our job is to know it, believe it, and obey it. Help us to live in these dark days as true lights of truth, love, and mercy. In Christ's name we pray.